Well, thank you so much. We appreciate being able to participate in this and talk to you about offshore wind. Uh, my name again is Jim Bennett. I'm with the Office of Renewable Energy Programs, and uh, the, which is inside the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management in the U.S. Department of the Interior. Uh, you, some of you may be familiar with our programs. They, it's essentially uh, offshore resources, uh, particularly oil and gas, especially in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, sand and gravel for beach renourishment, largely on the East Coast, and of course wind energy, um, mostly on the East Coast at, at the moment, but we've got some activity out West as well, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, the federal jurisdiction on, on the Outer Continental Shelf, continental shelf extends from uh, typically three miles offshore to the extent of the exclusive economic zone, about 200 miles offshore, and that's the area that we're involved in. Uh, for wind energy, of course, it's much more uh, coastal resources. Um, in 2009, we uh, promulgated a regulatory program to permit access by uh, uh, industry offshore for the development of uh, wind energy, and it is a four-stage process that includes a couple of years of planning and analysis and identification of appropriate areas for development, uh, a leasing process, which is largely an, an, an auction, uh, which also takes a couple of years up to five years worth of site assessment activities to characterize the site and uh, have, a, have a site assessment plan executed, and the construction and operation of a wind farm, which uh, takes uh, two or three years to build and would operate for another 25 or so. In order to determine where uh, wind farms are appropriate offshore, you need to know uh, a couple of things. The most obvious one is where the wind resource is. And if you look at this map, you'll see that uh, it is largely on the east coast uh, and the west coast where the wind resource is most economic to develop, and that's where we're finding the interest and activities are going to occur. But it isn't as simply as having the appropriate uh, wind resource you have to have a physical environment that is conducive to the construction of a wind farm, meaning that the technology we currently have available to us has to be able to be built in that environment. Uh, and then you also have to have access to market and a substantial market in order to deliver product. Uh, for, the, for these reasons, we've got uh, a fair amount of activity on our, on our east coast particularly from Massachusetts down into the Carolinas. Uh, we now have 11 commercial leases on the East Coast, and this, this uh, graphic displays uh, where they're distributed. Uh, uh, and we have a, a lease in every state from uh, Massachusetts down to Virginia, with the exception of New York, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, this gives you a little closer view of where these leases are. They include a, a couple off of Massachusetts, as well as the Cape Wind, which you may have heard of, um, and two off of Rhode Island uh, held by Deepwater Wind. That's in addition to the Block Island project, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, and uh, uh, there's two off of New Jersey from a sale we held in November of last year, uh, and one off of Delaware two off of Maryland with a company called U.S. Wind, and one off of Virginia with uh, Dominion Power. Uh, as you can see from this uh, diagram, as I mentioned, we have leases uh, for every state from Massachusetts to Virginia, with the exception of New York. Uh, New York is uh, a, a big item for us. I'm going to talk about it in just a minute. Uh, it is probably the strongest market for uh, electrical power. And uh, we are pushing to have a sale uh, in New York in 2016 in the area identified there on the map to see on your display. Uh, given the constraints with regard to navigation, uh, fishing concerns, this is the area that is uh, most uh, likely to be a, a viable commercial wind farm. Uh, and we hope to have a, 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 an auction by the end of the year. Uh, 
this slide just shows some of the activities that we're currently involved in. We have an environmental assessment out. We have five meetings coming up and an auction seminar in New York City along with an outreach meeting uh, by the end of the month. Uh, to talk a little bit about the West Coast, uh, which has become very, very active in the past year, we have uh, four unsolicited proposals at this point, one off of California, which would probably be using, uh, uh, or almost certainly be using floating technology, which we'll talk about in just a minute, uh, as well as uh, uh, three unsolicited proposals off of Hawaii. Uh, to talk a little bit about the technology, a lot of it is borrowed from the oil and gas industry, which fortunately, uh, 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 in this country, we have substantial uh, expertise, particularly down in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, in shallower waters, uh, we're, we're talking essentially about uh, monopile, basically a stick in the ground to uh, support a turbine uh, out to about 30 meters. And in transitional waters, we're looking at a, at a jacket, uh, similar to what's in the oil and gas industry. And beyond that, we're looking to floating technology, which is still, uh, uh, is still coming along. We're not quite there yet with the floating technology. Interestingly, about 90% of the, uh, of, of the wind resource that exists offshore in the U.S. is in waters that are too deep for uh, uh, technology as has been currently deployed. So there's a tremendous opportunity out there uh, for floating technology. Um, let me mention also that uh, uh, from this graph you can see uh, the, the size and location offshore of and the, and the average water depth of projects that have occurred over in Europe. And you can see that the ones that we're looking at, the areas that we're looking at in, uh, uh, why isn't this moving forward, uh, that we're, we're looking at that are moving forward in the U.S. Uh, are, are, are similar in terms of water depth and distance from shore. Um, you should have in front of you a diagram of, uh, of uh, growing wind turbines. That, the purpose of this is to give you an idea of the size of these uh, 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 mechanisms. They're, they're, they're not small and they're getting bigger. And, and you can see it in reference to the Empire State Building and the Golden Gate Bridge and also uh, the largest commercial jetliner, the A380 um, Airbus. And uh, uh, there, we're not sure what the limitations are on these, uh, whether there's technological limitations on the size. Uh, of course, with the larger size, you get greater efficiency and more electricity produced. But you also get uh, issues with regard to the ability to maintain and install. And you have sociological issues as well in terms of visibility because the larger ones are obviously more visible, uh, more visible and visible from farther and farther distances offshore. Uh, but that is where we stand right now. The Block Island project, which I'm going to talk to in just a minute, uh, is, uh, uh, it uses a, a 6 megawatt machine, which is what you see there under the 2013 uh, label. Uh, Block Island is the first offshore wind farm in the United States. It's a huge success for the industry so far. Uh, they have installed the jackets that, are, that, are, that will, will be the foundation for five wind turbines. The turbines are going to be installed later this summer. Uh, they are bottom-founded structures. They're not monopiles because they're in slightly, uh, slightly deeper water. And what's uh, particularly interesting here is the synergy between the uh, offshore wind industry and the oil and gas industry. These platforms were made down at uh, uh, Gulf Island Fabricators in the Gulf of Mexico, which is uh, 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 tr traditionally a uh, uh, oil and gas platform constructor. And uh, they modified them for this purpose and barged them around up to Rhode Island. So. Uh, the, 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 there's a lot of capabilities in the oil and gas industry that can be employed in a growing wind energy industry here in offshore U.S. Uh, talk a moment about floating structures, floating uh, turbines. 
they have been tested. They've been prototyped in a couple of different places uh, successfully, but they have not yet been deployed on any, any large scale. Uh, but the, uh, obviously the, the, the water depth are not, are not nearly as much of a factor. Uh, I think there's great potential for uh, deployment along the West Coast, which was the other area that has the greatest uh, wind resource uh, here in the States, uh, as well as uh, Hawaii. I want to also mention that uh, these are not simple projects. Uh, it takes five years or thereabouts of, uh, of data collection and design work in order to, to identify a wind farm project, an appropriate design for a wind farm. Uh, that means collection of a lot of very detailed data, meteorological data, uh, the, the wind and currents information. Uh, so on your screen you see a, a, a design, a deployment, I believe that's Horns Rev over in Denmark. Uh, and the two pictures are one of a, a meteorological tower and the other of a met barge uh, for measuring, for taking detailed measurements of wind in order to ensure that the permanent structures or the uh, uh, the long-term structures are placed in the right location. Uh, this is what we're working on now for the Outer Continental Shelf leases. Uh, several of the projects are in the site assessment phase to identify exactly how uh, the wind farm should be designed to submit a construction and operations plan. Um, Part of that site assessment, aside from the winds and the currents, is the identification of the uh, seafloor and the subsurface to determine uh, how to secure the structure uh, to the seafloor. Uh, and uh, they do a fair amount of uh, work, including some seismic work, which is very shallow, very, very different from seismic with regards to uh, oil and gas activities. Uh, it's high resolution, shallow seismic data. and uh, it's uh, one of those things that has to be done to identify uh, uh, discarded ordnance or prehistoric artifacts that might be in the, uh, in the area before construction can begin. So uh, the point is the facility design has to take into account an, uh, an awful lot of factors uh, including the, not just the wind uh, energy itself but the wake turbulence, storm conditions, uh, uh, ocean currents, and, and um, um, uh, how, how rough the, uh, the uh, ocean surface typically is, uh, what the, uh, for, for, for floating projects, buoyancy issues, as well as uh, the seafloor mechanics, all of which uh, lend themselves to uh, a very substantial amount of design uh, work uh, before the fact. And with that, uh, I, can, I guess I could turn it back over. There's several websites listed there for folks to uh, 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 get information from us or contact us if you have questions, and uh, we'll be happy to uh, open it up for questions now.